Whenever you're ready to start recording, Rob. We're good. <laughs> okay, well, everyone, uh, this is Shane Gibson with RackN. Welcome to Digital Rebar Provision Meetup number 22. Uh, got a little audio challenge here today at a public uh, cafe, so we're going to have a little little noise challenge we'll work through. Uh, today we've got on board with the Digital Rebar rack end team. We've got myself, uh, Rob Hirschfeld, Greg Altos, and Victor Lowther lurking around in the background there. And uh, Stephen Specter can't make it today. He's got his pups at the uh, vet, taking both dogs to the vet, he says, is a chore. <laughs> and uh, Today we're going to talk about uh, our upcoming version 3.10 release that should be out very imminently, a lot more imminently than 3.9.0 is imminently out for weeks on end. Uh, we've got a lot more focused sort of fixes and enhancements in 3.10, not a whole lot of big features. However, we do have a very exciting feature, which is DRP now emits Prometheus metrics and can emit those metrics to the Prometheus server is a built-in for a lot of the Golang-based components, pieces, parts, inside. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today, give a quick walkover of using that. Not a whole lot to show there yet because it's hot off the presses, uh, so to speak. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about operating system-specific workflows and being able to do uh, dynamic, cool things with a single workflow reacting to a given uh, OS type. And if we have time after that, hopefully we'll get to Terraform pooling. Uh, something that Rob Herschel has been working with recently is being able to uh, pool specific machines and do Terraform requests and make given pools on the fly. Uh, very cool stuff. Um, do we have uh, Greg? Uh, Rob, do we have Greg there ready to talk about B310 uh, releases? He's on another call. So, no, unfortunately, but if you pull up the release notes, I can walk through the feature sets. All righty then. I meant to do that already. Oh, wait. Greg, wait, Greg, can you, we're just going to have you walk through the 310. Okay. So, release notes are going to be under the leases page on the, I believe, the link. Uh, where are the release notes? No, it's right find? there. It's short. Scroll up. Scroll up. Up, 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 up. There you go. Can't hear it. It's, well. it's a draft. Here Specified. we go. That's, those are them. Um, All right, take it away, Rob. So this is uh, initial pass at the 310 release. Um, a lot of the Elements are around um, more flexible booting and some bug, bug fixes. So right, right now in tasks, you can specify metadata around um, what the task OS the task should run in, and based upon the OS detected on the system by the runner, it will then choose to run or not run certain tasks. This allows us to potentially build tasks that know how to run on both Windows or Linux and uh, make its choices that way. Um, there's a new interpreter field that you can specify as metadata and on a task um, or a template info. And if it's there, then that will pre-add um, that interpreter to the script. So that way, if you didn't have Python in the right spot or whatever, you could say use this Python with this Python script from the uh, template. Um, we use it for PowerShell and Windows, or it can be used for PowerShell. A uh, bunch of updates across the board on docs. There's some fixes to the facts. There's been um, references to the auto constructed docs for content packages and all that stuff. Um, it's a little bit more love. Yeah, there's more love to be done. But it's <laughs> the, the thing I would note with that is that we are trying to move the documentation closer to the source. So we're slowly moving documentation for like Kubernetes or Terraform into the content for that. So it's not going to be in the digital rebar doc tree. It'll be composed at build. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, so in a 3.9, I think we added secure parameters. Um, in 3.10, we're giving you a way to upgrade non-secure parameters into secure parameters um, by changing them in content packages. If you specify through the API, if you just like created a parameter, you have to bounce, you have to sig up the uh, agent or the uh, endpoint to have it convert. Um, we added the ability for content packages to define in their metadata a required features list. This is a comma separated list of features that must be in the DRP endpoints feature list, otherwise the content pack should not be loaded. This way the content package can say, I require this, and we can say, I don't have that going. Um, let's see. We started documenting the Terraform pool stuff, which we'll talk about later. Um, to make ESI XI boot cleaner um, and some of the updates and that that Victor was doing, we added uh, com boot support to DHCP, as well as our own Pixie boot, our iPixie update so that it can chain appropriately into XI. And that's kind of what those two are. As such, we build our own iPixie now and um, it has additional support. So that way you don't have to bounce between various boot loaders to install a ESXi. Um, let's see. There are cases where we let you render a per Mac uh, for the machine and it used to be only within boot environments. We've now expanded that so other things can do that. So um, tasks and other stuff in theory can do their own Mac based templates. Um, it has to do with the naming and the paths. Um, let's see, we added statistics and we'll talk about that a little bit more, metrics. Um, let's see, for ease of use, there's a DRP CLI extension that lets you watch events as they come in. So you can say like DRP CLI events watch and that will basically attach and watch the event stream. It's similar to the log one, but uh, this allows you to specify specific events. Um, we added a dash zip file to the install sh so that you can download the file name however you need to download it and then run it through the install.sh without necessarily having it to talk back to you. And then, like I said, lots of doc fixes across the board. And then uh, we added the ability for the Mac adder. Um, template expander helper function to take no parameters. We found people were forgetting to add parameters to it and it was exploding. So that fixes. Uh, with regard to bug fixes, um, there were cases where if a machine was rebooted out from underneath a runner, it would uh, not necessarily restart properly, so we fixed that. Um, on Windows systems, PowerShell really should be run with a dash file so that it can collect error codes properly. It mostly works without it, but it's kind of poor. We got uh, code coverage working again, so the code coverage number now actually kind of reflects what the test touch. Um, we took a Docker, a um, doc pull request to fix some typos, which kind of was cool. Um, we went through and did some cleanup for some of the metricing tools, getting better at some of those metrics too. Uh, let's see. In some cases, when the template fails to render, we would just say, ah, crash, and then loop. Um, you should get better details now on why a template render failed into the actual job log. So that should help you when you're debugging your templates as you're building them. Um, that's helpful, that's really helpful. <laughs> uh, there was a case in the runner where when the workflow changed, it would just sit there and go, yeah, great, whatever. Uh, this is particularly pro problematic if the workflow didn't change the stage or boot environment. So mm -hmm. it would just cause you to sit there. Is that the bug I was hitting? Yeah. Oh, um, and then um, we reformatted some of the job log stuff so that uh, it looks a little better and you can actually get partial updates and all sorts of stuff along those lines. Um, there's some UX features around some of that. Um, things like in the job log, you can now have a retry from the job that failed. Um, you can also have a button that will let you um, turn on the RS debug flag to true. 
so that you can then rerun it and get debug output from the script. Um, some the, on the UX side, we fixed some clone issues um, and in general, just clean up and flow around um, <laughs> workflow. Prop added button says he was encountering yeah. a scripting problem. Also, something of note on the UX for its release, uh, change stage maps go away. Oh yeah. They're not gonna be visible. May they rest in peace. They were wonderful while they lasted. A lot of, a lot of code. Was so prepared. use thy workflows always. So, I mean, that's kind of the gist of what we've done. Um, we're working on a few other test issues and stuff like that, and when those get resolved, and maybe another UX feature as well as a, a, a job log bug fix, then we'll crank the release. So Greg, what are we looking at for uh, pushing us out the door another day or two? Hopefully the next day or two, yeah. End of week. Or, yeah, somewhere End of the week for sure, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's my goal. Okay, excellent. All right, um, moving on. Uh, thank you, Greg, appreciate that. We're going to move on to DRP Prometheus metrics. Uh, saw that in the uh, release notes for 3.10. Currently, if you want to play with this, you have to pull uh, the current tip version, uh, which should be 3.09-tip-84 today, uh, which has this code. Uh, when we do cut 3.10.0, it'll contain all of those features and fixes. But what's been added is, let me uh, change my share here and switch to, I have no idea which of these it should be, maybe that one. Let's try that window. And let's All right, so I lost a good old chat. So here we go. Um, all right, so on a DRP endpoint, when you start up uh, DRP, there's a new set of options. If you run dr-provision with help, you'll now see that there's two options. There's a Prometheus gateway URL where we'll push metrics to, and you can define the interval at which to push metrics. So the default is set to five seconds. Then you also have to specify uh, the scrape port, uh, which is the metrics port. So setting metrics port defines uh, which port that the uh, HTTP server will listen on for metrics. The default is set to 8080, uh, and then you'll be able to plumb metrics. Uh, the other pieces on your Prometheus endpoint, you need to uh, modify your Prometheus uh, YAML file. Uh, mine happens to be in serve Prometheus server Prometheus YAML. And we'll now see uh, at the end, I have this new stanza here, which sets a job name. Uh, job name is arbitrary. In this case, I called it DRP. You might want to call it DRP something else that might be specific to a given DRP. That makes more sense. Uh, the scrape interval for scraping the port, and then the actual uh, target that we're going to scrape. In this case, um, I set the target port to 8888 since I had uh, something else running on 8080, so I'm going to set, I set the custom port on that. So when I start up uh, uh, DRP now, uh, let's see if I have it in my um, shell history, Prometheus. Uh, no, oh right, I had to log out back in. I think here we go. Uh, So when I started up DR provision, uh, I set the flags for the metrics port, and then I set the gateway port uh, for uh, pushing the metrics as well. So this happens to be on my local host. I have Prometheus running here in conjunction with that uh, Prometheus YAML. So once that's done and you fire it up and it's running, uh, I think we get... Uh, yeah, so you'll see uh, this was a previous uh, run uh, that I failed on because I, I double started it. Um, I guess we don't get a whole lot out of the log uh, by default, but if we jump back to 
Prometheus itself and the Prometheus UX. Uh, let me uh, switch again. Share here. Share to. Here we go. So this is the standard uh, Prometheus uh, web interface. It's not a whole lot to it. It's really not terribly useful or functional as a real service. Uh, at some point here in the future, we'll um, build up a Grafana dashboard that'll reference all of this. But we can see here when we look at the various uh, metrics that we can collect. Uh, one note, uh, hopefully before 310 ships, we're going to change the uh, pre so that's a lot of metrics. There's a lot of metrics, yeah. So right now, um, the metrics are not prefixed with DRP, so they um, don't sort exactly cleanly. You don't really see the separation of uh, some of these metrics like static, which is uh, one of the DRP metrics on the static ports. So they're not sorted in numerical order. We're going to prefix that with DRP underscore. And then we'll be able to uh, rep find very quickly all of the metrics related to DRP. But so we, we can actually see there's a whole pile of API uh, metrics here we can pull. There's a lot of the bin L stuff. Nobody cares about that it's a Microsoft protocol, protocol, but if you're actually using it, you might care about it. So there you go, it's there. Here's the other thing that's really cool. In addition to giving you a DHCP service with a full uh, API, RESTful API over the top of it. Not a whole lot of uh, DHCP services offer that out of the box. We now offer uh, metrics coming out of uh, Prometheus as native to the platform. So that's super cool to be able to get a bunch of metrics off of that. Um, any of you folks playing with us in the uh, field, if you have any um, questions or requests for enhancements or changes to the metrics, we're excited and interested to see those. Um, then also we scroll down here, we see our, H our static uh, HTTP services. How is HTTP different from static? That's a question I have. We have a static web server built into the system that is def it's a different web server. Okay. The there you go. Uh, sure. And I'm. We do. We do. Did actually. the net come off of us, or is this from one of my other? I don't think. I think this is coming off of us. Net contract. Dialer. No idea. I have no idea where that comes from. Uh, and then, so last, going past the node exporter stats, uh, a lot of stuff coming off node exporter. Uh, and then we also have process. And then we have static and TFTP. So the static uh, HTTP server specs and TFTP specs. So you can see um, this DRP endpoint that I'm, um, uh, met I have metrics on right now, there's nothing on it. I mean, literally there's nothing on it. So there's not a whole lot of interesting things to see uh, in the metrics. I didn't have a chance to generate a bunch of API calls against it to, to give you any coolness. Uh, but essentially through the uh, DRP or the uh, um, Prometheus uh, tooling, you can select different graphs. So we could come down here, select an to add a graph, I've got to move my windows around because I can't see anything with a little laptop screen. So if we come down here to the metrics, we can select a new, uh, let's say we want to do DHCP uh, I don't know, let's just say size bytes, I don't know. There you go. So we have DHCP size bytes. We're going to um, oh, since I don't have any DHCP turned on on this, obviously I can't show you anything on that, so that's um, non-pattern, sorry. So let's just do uh, static and then see if we get anything on there. There we go. So if we turn down our um, monitoring window, we'll start to see uh, the stats that have been coming off there. It's flat line right now since there's not a whole lot going on with the service, but it gives you just a real quick brief overview of some of the metrics that we're going to be generating off of this, and hopefully that's really useful for benchmarking your uh, DRP system. And we have a number of customers that are starting to go to high scale production and being able to measure and uh, introspect into what's happening into the different subsystems will help us as we go forward with additional performance tuning and allow us to also come up with uh, potentially better uh, guidelines for uh, sizing for DRP itself, depending on your different workloads. So we'll be able to start providing a lot more guidance and insight on how to build 
your DRPN points or how to um, provision them with resource memory CPU disks and all of those fun things and how the code itself is operating. So it's very cool. Uh, Greg uh, Althaus put those that in a couple weeks ago, I think, and it's uh, just finally starting to surface. Uh, looking forward to people's uh, feedback from using that in the field. I'm excited about using it myself and getting a Grafana dashboard built up around it as well. All right. Uh, moving on, we were going to do something else. Uh, we were going to figure out what I did with So uh, moving on, we're going to look at, talk a little bit, well, Greg talked a little bit about OS specific workflows already uh, and how the runner can react to uh, metadata. Um, is there any more that we want to provide on that? Besides so the I, notes? I can explain some of the background in the use case uh, of why we were doing it. And, and it'll get more clear, I think, as, as, the, as the, after the release. But what we saw, there was a pattern we saw with certain customers who had multiple operating systems and different, um, especially imaging flows, like they wanted to image Windows and Linux. And what was happening is you would have to know which operating system you were going to deploy. You put two different workflows together, and it was basically causing a lot of sprawl in workflows and a lot of confusion when you clone things. It was, it was just getting to be sort of messy when the workflows were 90% the same except for some post-provisioning steps. And yeah. so the idea with this, there were a couple other drivers for it, but this was the primary. The idea here was that during that process, it really should just be, this is my stage, and then I have tasks that are applied for different operating systems, or really templates that are applied for different operating systems. I think it's a task, it's a task, task metadata. And so what that allows you to do is create a stage that does something, and then you could do it in multiple operating systems without having to create three different work, whole different workflows or fork the workflow in weird ways. So this really, um, especially for places where there's a relatively small delta in the step you need to do, allows you to make very surgical changes with respect to operating systems inside of a much bigger workflow. That, that's that's one of the use cases. There's some other there's some other things we're doing um, around um, booting esoteric operating systems and dealing with like ARM hardware and stuff like that, where you actually you, know, you do care about um, what's happening. Uh, so that's important. And then the, the way it's built, um, it is backwards compatible. Uh, but when the, the latest CLI requests template expansion, it's going to give you architecture information. And then if the metadata is set, it will send appropriate data back. So it's, um, it's a very silent addition from a uh, backwards compatibility. Cool. Excellent. Uh, anything else on OS specific uh, runner and workflow changes? Yeah, I don't think so. This is one of those ones where it's a big feature. It's a nice feature in the core, and it's, you're not going to see a lot of examples of it that fast. Right. Yep. So. Okay, cool. Well, i uh, turn it over to you to talk about Terraform cooling, and Linda, and we can wrap things up. Okay. Yeah, happy to. Um, I'm trying to decide if I want to try and show this. I, I, I might just talk it through because um, it's, it's not that complicated to talk through. Um, so there was a bug in, in our Terraform provider that was, uh, we were misnaming the JSON filter. So when you, when you, so, so let me, I, I need to explain how Terraform filters work. Um, let me pull up a piece of code. Um, I think. Bear with me for just a moment. Oh, it's going to be my folder things. Okay. I'll share my screen in just a second. Uh, let me get the file. First. Yeah. All right. Here comes my screen. Um, 
And this is this is worth noting for the Terraform. We've been we've been doing some work with Terraform. We're we're discussing some much bigger changes to Terraform because there, there's a fundamental flaw in the inter interactions between Terraform and Digital Rebar, where if you're not careful, it will wipe out changes that Digital Rebar has made into the system when you rerun a plan. So if you're using Terraform, do not use it to update and reapply a plan. Use it essentially to set a plan and destroy. Do not reapply the same plan right now. It will cause uh, bad behavior. Um, that concern might stay with us for a long time, um, although we're working on some strategies to make it less, less potentially less effective. Um, that would take some more explanation that I'm, I'm probably going to take time to give. Um, but here's here's what what we fix. So in the documentation, there's some chatter in the community about this. Um, you can specify a filter. The filter has a name of the field that you're filtering and the JSON, and the JSON value. This it doesn't just say value; it says JSON value, because of the way Terraform processes these strings, you actually are supplying it in JSON format, and you have to decorate it if you want something besides a string. It's a little confusing, but um, it has to do with the way JSON, the way Terraform processes this information in limited data types. Um, and so here's, so if I wanted to only get machines that were named Greg, I can't do wildcards, this would be a pretty limited function thing. And so the filter is super handy because you can also specify a parameter for the machine and then it will, you can use parameters to do filters. So for example, if I wanted all my Dell servers and I collected that using the inventory. So we have the inventory workflow. If you added that stage and then created a, a parameter called inventory slash Dell or slash type, and it put in the vendor, or inventory slash vendor, and it put in the vendor, then you could put inventory vendor here, put Dell, HP, it's micro, whatever matched, and then it would give you machines that match that. What? Could you make your uh, text bigger, please? It's ant size. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. How's that? A little better. You could go a little more if you want it. There you go. Okay. Here you go. Right. So, so the key, the key. So this is a really nice thing, um, and I tried to increase the document, improve the documentation around this. But for that to work, you must define the parameter. So it doesn't work on ad hoc parameters. It only works on defined parameters. We actually made a matching change to the inventory workflow that allows you to flatten the inventory. Um, and we've talked about the inventory in the past, so I won't go back into it, but it flattens the inventory into a, a parameter list for this, for this exact function. So you can, using the inventory uh, stage, you can literally pull information out of the system and then filter it with Terraform um, with just a couple of checkboxes. It's pretty awesome from that perspective. Um, but, but along those lines, and that's actually API behavior, it's just using the API filter and search. Um, but what that enabled us to do was we also realized we could add a pool, and we have a lot of user requests for this feature. So they want to be able to take machines in their, their Terraform inventory and segment them into different pools. So what we added was there's a parameter called Terraform pool. It's now included in the Terraform content pack um, that defaults to the word default. And um, so in the system, if you omit pool as an instruction, we'll just assume you want to default. So um, by, def by default, we always are going to create a single default pool and all the machines will be pulled from it. If you start setting the parameter pool, either in a profile or on the machine itself, to something something different, you you can then specify the pool in the Terraform plan, and it will only pull machines from the pool that you asked for. Does that it's, does that make sense? So this is saying I have a hundred machines. I've put them into a high performance, high disk, generic use pool or default. And then when I do my Terraform plan, I, I'm going to specify which pool I want to I want to take machines from. So that would let you build a Terraform plan 
where you could actually say, I need some compute machines, I need some storage machines, and I need some you know, general purpose machines. And you would actually do those as three resource sets. And you could actually then build a plan that had you know, uh, 10, 10 general nodes and three storage nodes for your etcd cluster. App, you know, do the appropriate function. Um, and because it's driven by the profiles or you know, these profiles and parameters, it's super easy to then add that in as a capability for Terraform. It's a big, it's a, it's a frequent request we had and we just decided to make it easy. Otherwise you have to do it with filters. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, so that, uh, that wraps up sort of the content we have uh, lined up for today. Uh, we talked about the 3.10.0 uh, release that should be out uh, hopefully no later than the end of this week, possibly by uh, Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, just working out a few minor details around some of the last uh, fit and finish on that. Uh, then we also talked a little bit about uh, the DRP Prometheus metrics and a quick uh, overview of that, uh, OS specific workflows and Rob wrapped us up with Terraform pooling. Uh, any questions from uh, community? <laughs> not really, all right. So on chat, we got a not really. So uh, I think that's a wrap for uh, version 22. Uh, we'll have the video out uh, in the next uh, couple of hours. We'll post that on the uh, Rackin uh, community channel and we'll post it on the meetup page as well. Uh, until then, uh, we'll be back, I think the, what, the 13th or so of 14th of uh, August for the next meetup for version 23. Uh, look forward to seeing you all there. And in the meantime, if you have any feedback on Prometheus or any of the other cool bits, uh, looking forward to feedback, you get a chance to use the Terraform pooling feature, uh, or if you have questions around the OS specific uh, runner behavior and workflows, uh, hit us up on Pound Community. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Shane.